the cloth story. Bate. They can be made into kaftans, bajukurongs, headscarves, and even shirts. But to produce a piece of bate involves a really long process and a few techniques which include mun chanting and stamping. The patterns on bate are usually inspired by nature and are beautifully drawn by experts. Join me, Ara Bird, as we learn more about the art of bate here on The Cloth Story. On the surface, a well put together outfit completes an incredible and confident look on a person that is accessorized beautifully from head to toe. This outer experience helps shine one's inner boldness and confidence as they become comfortable and pleased in the way they look. Indonesia pun ada juga yang pelangi Tapi yang bezakan adalah kita teknik kita berbeza dengan teknik mereka Teknik kita, kita lebih sesuaikan kepada sama ada tujuan untuk batik sarung ataupun selendang the reason why we choose certain clothes are often due to the designs and motifs on the material. Designs are often influenced by inspirations gathered from experiences, occurring images in one's mind, or other forms of living things like the flora and fauna in the surroundings. These creative ideas will then be transformed into a work of art, translating the ideas through its design techniques and styling of the motifs. Different patterns bring different meanings. The evolution of bate in the Malay world saw a unique type of bate material being introduced in the year 1770 called kain pelangi or rainbow cloth. It has been said to be the first and longest existing bate in the world of textiles. During that time, a woman known as Mina Plangi, who works as a weaver in a palace, was the first person to have made the rainbow cloth. Using the tie and dye technique, or also called the rainbow technique, she created a cloth full of colors. Haji Chetsu Haji Isha was the first individual to introduce bate in an area called Lorong Gajah Mati in Kota Baru, Kelantan back in 1911. His legacy was kept alive for four generations. The most famous batik making technique at that time, which was the tie and dye technique, was the first one he focused on. This popularized the rainbow bate. Rainbow bate or rainbow cloth is known for its tedious and fine technique. The cloth is temporarily sewn at certain parts that outlines the intended motifs. After it has been dipped in natural dye, the threads previously sewn are removed and voila, a unique design has been created through this stitching technique better known as the trite technique. Trite is just a different way of creating patterns onto the fabric. You can use different forms. So trite is like sewing. So when you sew, you, you create like different different types. Like you do like that, you sew it together, and all the things that you sew together, that is where the, uh, the dye is not going to penetrate. Um, how, what, what I'm showing you today is actually um, a folding technique, shibori style again. And shibori is just the art of resist. To make lines, you then fold your fabric like a fan or an accordion. And uh, once you have that, I'm doing this very loosely. Um, you can have a clamp over and you put it together and then you put color in. So this clamp that's putting it, this clamp that's keeping the fabric together, that part is not going to have color. This is going to have color, this is going to have color. So this part is the resist part, you know, you're not allowing color to enter this area. So that's basically it. So knowing all those techniques and just combining it to make your own patterns, that's all it is. Although new techniques have evolved over time, the old technique is never forgotten. This particular new technique by Nini Marini uses isopropyl to spread colors without having to dip the cloth in dye bath. How creative! Truly an adaptable innovation fit for youngsters and children these days, allowing them to easily explore the bate from all sorts of angles and approach. Starting from something simple might help grow that initial interest into a deep appreciation and love for our beautiful art of the Bate legacy. Kota Baru Kelantan, the glorious stage for Bate lovers. Each motif created has its aesthetic values. 
hence why Bate and its prestige has been recognized globally, shedding light on our culture for the world to see. One of the techniques that has retained its popularity time and again is the bate trap or stamping technique using blocks. We are right now in Kampong Penambang to meet Tuan Haji Ibrahim, who is an Adi guru or a master at bate trap. He's been manufacturing bate trap since 1986, a very long time. Mana rumah Pak Din? Sana, sana. Boleh tak akan nak bawa? Nak bawa? Nih. Awak kat belakang. Okay, jump. Dahulu dia kita kata kita nak cari kerja ni memang susah. Jadi salah satu pada dulu ada uh, kilang batik saja. Jadi saya bekerja dulu dengan orang Melayu dulu sampai tahun 86 tu uh, kita majikan saya tu berhenti dulu. Tapi tahun 80 ni saya ambil alih kilang tu. Jadi saya usaha sendirilah cik tu ya tiga empat orang pekerja daripada modal tu 1000 jadi berkembang-kembang saya selalu pergi ke pasar-pasar di Kota Baru dan di sana di sanalah kita banyak mendapat tumpahan Kita kebanyakan tu pattern dan corak dia berkaitan pada kebanyakannya permintaan pelanggan. Dia akan bawa corak yang dia ramahu. Jadi kita ambil, kita buat blok, kita buat cara dia tu. It's not easy to fill a fabric with motifs full of meanings behind it. It's not easy to translate these ideas onto a white canvas. It is not easy to turn a cloth into a masterpiece. The Cloth Story This is where I've gotten most of my knowledge on block stamp bate. From a plain cloth, it is stamped till its completion. I was certain to make full use of this rare opportunity and soak in all the knowledge I could from the master himself, Tuan Haji Ibrahim Ismail. Behind us, we have ready-made batik cardigans and also cloth ready to be shipped. And with me, we also have Tuan Haji Ibrahim, the man responsible for it, who is an Adi Guru and a master in batik terap. He's been manufacturing terap since 1986. Apa khabar? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Khabar baik. Nak tanya Pak Cik, apa beza um, batik canting dengan batik terap? Batik terap tu dia menggunakan blok. Eh, satu blok itu mengandungi bunga yang telah dilukis. Okay. Tapi kalau batik cantik ini, dia menggunakan idea sepatan. Eh, di atas kain itu dia draw, draw, draw itu mengikut idea keluar. Macam mana dia punya desain nak tobik? So, kat belakang kita ni kita ada um, um, nama um, dia apa ni? Ini dipanggil pucuk rebung. Ini ni blok lah blok yang ni diperbuat daripada rebung, rebung, tembaga, uh, tembaga. Besi tembaga. Blok ni kita hanya celup, kita hanya letak di atas lilin saja. Uh -huh. Lepas tu kita akak dia letak atas kain. Itu dia akan tubik keluar ni bunga-bunga yang terlekat di besi ni. Oh, so dia ah. jadi pattern. Pattern tu yang mengikut telah disustung. Musim-musim terkujuh macam mana kalau ada yeah. permintaan yang banyak nak keringkan macam mana? Dia yeah. kalau hak bahagian cok ni, mm -mm. dia kalau mungkin buat musim sejuk, mm -mm. lagi cantik. Lilin tu mudah kering. Kalau um, nak buat sarung, mm -hmm. kena ada ni. Benda ni apa yeah. nama dia? Benda ni Aa. kebiasaannya, kalau kain sarung, kiranya ada pucuk rebung, Aa. dia kena ada gunung. Be gunung hanya terletak di bera kain saja. De? Di tepi kain saja. To apply means to stamp 
and indirectly means to design a motif that has been created by its batik maker inspired by the things he's seen, especially the flora and fauna. These inspirations are mixed with deep connections with its subject matters. That's why there's always a story behind a batik that's been made, especially the old ones as it's usually based on occurrences at said times. After the rainbow cloth technique, the block stamping technique became extremely huge in 1940. Back then, the late Haji Chetsu designed the batik blocks using wood. But now, with innovation, the blocks are made out of copper and metal to adapt to the current times. And at the same time, it is meant to create finer designs and much more intricate details. And most importantly, of great quality and durability. As for the coloring process, natural dye and colorants were used back then. However, it is much more practical and safe to use commercial colorants now, easily obtained and of good quality. Beautiful elements of colors with a variety of color tones on a cloth and then on a fabric that has been designed or stamped will create an exclusive and elegant style. What's interesting now, it's not merely seen on traditional attire, but on t-shirts, pants and other clothing as well. So this is the superstar of all processes, which is the actual therap. Uh, technique. As you can see, only OGs are doing it. I'm pretty sure it is a very tough uh, skill to acquire. He is currently stamping wax onto a, uh, they call it the rainbow t-shirts. Right now we call it the, the tie-dye t-shirts. And right after that, the wet wax will be dried. What do you think about that? Once the wax is dried up, it is soaked into salt water before it is dyed on into the, the desired colour. And right after that, they will remove the wax in hot water to remove, which is this, this tough part. And then they rinse it and you get your bate tie-dye t-shirt. Block stamped bate is one of the leading and long-standing techniques in the production of bate. Being a heritage that has been mastered for centuries, it's no wonder that bate has penetrated the international market. What's even more impressive is the fact that Bate is still relevant till this day. The Cloth Story Bate, an art form that showcases the brilliance of a nation's legacy. Since the 19th century, humans have found and tried out a few ways in producing traditional Bate. So in Malay Peninsula, Originally, the batiks were done on um, wooden blocks. Uh, they used a wooden block and uh, put it on a colour paste and then immediately print it on the cotton cloth, just directly printed. So they should be called block uh, prints. Now, this doesn't exist only in Kelantan and Trengganu, but the whole of the Langkasuka region, which is, you know, you, if you go to Naratiwat and Yala and Patani, these three districts used to be uh, part of the kingdom of Patani, they all produce the woodblock batiks. How do I know? Because I went to the museums there and I saw the same type of woodblocks. These uh, wooden blocks later, this was before the 1920s. So after the 1920s, there were two people in Kelantan and Tringanu. Each of them invited the Javanese uh, batik makers to help them improve their batik technique. And the Javanese said, if you use the wooden blocks, the patterns will not be as fine, as refined. Because with the copper metal, you can make it very thin. Whereas in the wooden blocks, if it's too thin, it will break. So then they um, invited the Javanese over in the 1920s and they started copying the Indonesian batiks. And later on, they started creating their own patterns. So some people misunderstand. When they look at the Indonesian batik from Kelantan, they say, oh, this is from Java. But actually, it's not. It's actually Trengganu and Kelantan batiks copying the Javanese ones in the early period. So after the 20s and 30s, right, they advanced into their own style. You know, they used their own plants and flowers as patterns. And then later on, uh, they developed batik tulis, which is hand-painted. Some drizzles to complement the weather, 
but not enough to stop my high spirits and enthusiasm in meeting a respectable master block maker. Without this man, it'll be hard for a block stamp batik maker to do his stamping. The interdependence of a block maker and a batik maker is undeniable. A pattern design requires conceptions from both parties. Master Abdul Ghani bin Mat, or fondly known as Pok Ghani, is an expert at block making. He has his own followers and is still very much active. Extremely happy that we managed to catch Pak Cik Ghani, who is a master at making blocks atau adi guru. Assalamualaikum, Pak Cik. Waalaikumsalam. Saya nak tanya, adalah soalan-soalan yang saya nak tanya, boleh? Boleh. Saya tahu kalau blok ni dia diperbuat daripada um, tembaga, tembaga, kan? Ya. Tapi cara membuat ini macam mana? Tak pada mulanya kita kena buat desain dulu, kena Aa. reka cipta desain kan? Aa. Jadi kan macam ni ke? Jadi kan macam ni ke? Lepas tu kita potong tembaga kecil-kecil ini. Ini yang tengah Aa, buat kecil. lah. Ha, sekarang ni saya buat. Aa. Lepas tu kita bentukkan lah. So you will start drawing it onto um, a piece of paper. And he will then use these strips of copper, and he'll cut it into the uh, design that he wants it to be before it is fitted into ni sebelum dimasukkan sini lah into a block. Patu kita akan satukan uh, design antara apa yang kita bentuk tu lah bentuk semua tu kita akan satukan semua ni pakai peti ya. Kita akan buat pemegai dia pula. Lepas siap pemegai ni, uh, last kali dah, kita akan ratakan dia pakai mesin kat belakang tu. Mesin tu. Tadi, saya ada pergi jumpa Adi Guru uh, ha Batik. Tuan Haji Ibrahim. Ha, ya. Lepas tu, kita berceritalah hmm. tentang membuat uh, apa ter Batik. terap, terap uh, pucuk rebung. Dia punya desain sentiasa sama atau dia ada lain ada perbezaan dia? Ya. Dia kena buat lain-lain. Kita tak boleh buat desain sama aja. Kat sana saya tengok tajam sikit. Ha ah, tu corak corak lamalah kita tengok. Sekali kita, lah kita sekali dah ubah. Yang ni uh, pak cik uh, free hand lah ni. Ha ah, kita rugi ada teknik dia lah cara Ooh. dia. Look at that work so fun. Ni kalau kita buat desain ke? Mm -mm. uh, lebih kurang 2 atau 3 jam untuk buat desain pucuk bubung ini. Untuk melukis saja. Ah, melukis saja. 2 atau 3 hmm. jam. Oh, drawing itself takes 3 hours to complete. Ha. Tapi kalau okey, ni kalau saya tengoklah orang dari orang luar yang saya tak berapa uh, tahu tentang ha, membuat ya. blok ni, ha. nampak rumit. Ha. Tapi dalam semua proses ni atau membuat blok ni yang mana paling rumit? Paling rumit ini pucuk bubung. Pasal kita banyak pakai titik apa? Oh. Desain titik ni memang susah kita nak buat. Titik so, tu susah kita nak buat. Nampak tak? Cik-cik alu-alu ni. Oh. Titik tu yang lambat kita buat. Saya ada perasan tadi Pak Cik. Saya ni dari Sarawak. So saya tengok desain ni tadi, teringat pula dengan puak dekat Sarawak tu, puak kumbu. Ni macam desain Sarawak ni memang desain Sarawak ke atau uh, tak sengaja jadi desain Sarawak? Tak sebenarnya desain ni dah ada lah pun orang Sarawak pun dah menyuruh saya ah, buat benda ni kan. Sebab dia dengan orang Sarawak juga. Ah, kan? Memang lah tapi tapi yang ni saya ubah sikit lah, ubah suai. Oh. Supaya nampak corok lebih menarik ke apa. Ha. Banyak orang berkena dengan desain sawak. Di Malaysia, apa ni? Dekat Semenanjung, Semenanjung ni. pun? Oh, ramai oh. minat desain sawak. Eh, saya pun banyak tak jugalah saya, saya tengok <laughs> sebenarnya. Um, so, he he actually supplies to Sarawakian designers as well. And yes, this is um, what I believe is based um, out of, uh, based from a Puak Kumbu motif. Saya nak tahu lebih lanjut sikit lagi lah macam mana Pak Cik buat blok-blok ni sebab saya tengok alat-alat ni banyak pasu benda-benda macam ni saya nak tengok sikit boleh Pak Cik tu. Boleh insya-Allah boleh boleh. Nanti saya tunjuk uh -huh. macam mana cara. Pieces of metals are prepared, flattened and shaped for the process of making the handle of the batik block. The handle is connected to the design stamp. Next is of course the copper that is essential for the process of making the motifs and patterns on the block which reflect the designs sketched on paper. The batik block 
or simply known as sarang, goes through a couple of processes before it is completely done. Among them is the process of soldering the metal or copper using lead. Lastly, a finished block that has been soldered needs to undergo a final process which is to even out the surface of the sarang and making sure it is smooth. Meticulous and fine crafts like these are well respected and admired by the younger generation of block makers. Pak Gani shares that it takes patience and great discipline to design and make a batik block that is of good quality and exclusive. Possessing such principles is the reason why Pak Gani's craftsmanship is not only sought after locally, but internationally as well. Without the skills, expertise, and experience gathered, the making of a batik block will not be easy. The title Adi Guru or master is a title well earned and should be respected greatly as it is not easy to gain knowledge, experience and techniques that can later be shared with generations to come. It is not easy to maintain the relevance of an artwork for centuries. It is not easy to create a batik block that contains soul, contains depth, contains exquisite meanings behind its patterns an art form that needs to be protected at all costs.